Thank you, the wit. Do you all hear me well? Yeah. So thank you, the wit. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers. It's uh, really, I'm really, really happy to be back in Trieste. Last time I was here was eight years ago, and I had a four-month-old baby with me. So this time I'm more relaxed, and, and hopefully we'll get to see the city. And uh, very happy that the city has uh, welcomed us with, with such a beautiful weather. So that's just that background is the sunset yesterday. You see my pointer, yeah. Okay, so I'll tell you about pathways of unlinking by local reconnection. I'll start with a little, with a little motivation. Local reconnection events appear in many different contexts. For example, they appear uh, as magnetic reconnection in solar coronal loops, in knotted vortices in fluid dynamics. So this is an experiment performed in uh, Irvine's lab where they 3D printed knots and two component links with different topologies. They blew a fluid through it, and um, there will be a few talks this week that will refer to this with much more expertise than the one I have. Um, and the bubbles that came out were knotted, and these knots slowly unknotted themselves, or the links slowly unlinked themselves until they got to a trivial configuration. And locally, each unlinking reaction was mediated by a reconnection event that locally looks like this. This is very, very similar to local reconnection that we see in the context of recombination in biology. And that's what brought me to that topic, uh, I mean, to thinking about local reconnection in the global sense. So, so my work for many years has been on the action of enzymes that change the topology of DNA so, for example, site-specific recombination enzymes or type 2 topoisomerase enzymes. I will focus in this talk on site-specific recombination. But a lot of the things that I'll say here are applicable to other reconnection events in nature, and so in physics, in chemistry. So, site, what are site-specific recombinases? These are enzymes that bind two short and identical sequences of DNA, and by short, I mean between 5 and 50 base pairs long. So this, these are very stiff pieces of DNA, segments of double-stranded DNA, and they act by a cut, recombine, and paste reaction. So they will introduce a double-stranded break in each one of the two sides. So here the sides are indicated by red arrows. If you don't see, one arrow is pointing from left to right, and the other one points from right to left. The blue balls are representing two specific enzymes. So for example, XCRC and D that I'm, I have worked on, but uh, it could be any other site-specific recombination enzyme. And in the case of XCRC and D, these enzymes belong to the tyrosine family of recombinases, and they cleave the DNA in two steps. Other enzymes in the serine family cleave the DNA in just one step. They introduce double-stranded break at once. But uh, here we see a small cleavage, a strand exchange, followed by an isomerization step where the second cleavage sites come together. There's a second cleavage, recombination event, and the net effect is that you go from this configuration to this reconnected configuration. Changes in the DNA mediated by these enzymes can have topological effects, and that's what brings us here, but they can also have very important phenotypic effects. So just to give you an example, I mean, here there's three major examples, but uh, let me just talk about this one, the process of integration. This is used by viruses, for example, bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria will introduce their DNA, so will will recognize the, the cellular host, and they will inject the DNA into the cellular host. And if the virus is a lysogenic virus, it goes into a lysogenic cycle by integrating in its DNA into the host's DNA. So in, in this cartoon, this would be the viral DNA, circular viral DNA. It, it, the DNA circularizes upon entering the cell. And these on the left will be the bacterial DNA, for example. And a site-specific recombination reaction, for example, integrates of lambda int, will integrate the viral DNA into the bacterial DNA, which can then 
be replicated at every cycle and be inherited by any new daughter cell before being excised again and generating new viruses to kill the cell. So that's just one example, but there's other important examples. For example, inversion of, of segments which can change the genome. And as it changes the genome, as a byproduct, it might have a topological effect. Okay, so, so I'll focus on site-specific recombination. Let me rewind and get you started since this is a very interdisciplinary audience uh, for people who are not working actively on, on, uh, bi in biology. Let's remember that DNA is a right-handed double helix consisting of two sugar phosphate backbones. Each backbone is lined up by nucleotides adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine pairs up with thymine, guanine pairs up with cytosine via hydrogen bonds. And because the sugar phosphate nucleotide unit uh, is not symmetrical, when they pair up, as they stack on, a double helix is formed. So this is a, a cartoon of the right-handed double helix. This structure was proposed in a seminal paper by Watson and Crick in 1953, where they based their model for the structure of DNA on the X-ray crystallographical work of Rosalind Franklin and Ryan Go uh, Raymond Gosling, who was her graduate student at the time, and in particular on this specific photo 51. Okay, so Watson and Crick wrote a paper in Nature in 1953 where they proposed this double helical structure of DNA. And in that paper, they have a sentence where they say, well, this structure of DNA automatically suggests a copying mechanism for the molecule. So in, later that year, they published a second paper, also in Nature, where they started exploring this idea on how the DNA is replicated inside the cell. And in that paper, they write, since the two chains in our model intertwine, it's essential for them to untwist if they are to separate. So during replication, uh, helicases come in and they open up the helix. They break the hydrogen bonds and open up the helix. So that's the untwisting. And although it's difficult at the moment to see how these processes occur without everything getting tangled, we do not feel that this objection will be insuperable. And I show this quote a lot because Yes, indeed. I mean, if you have two, if you have a helix and you open it, the torsional stress from the helix will be accumulated on one side. You will have a huge accumulation of positive supercoils. And depending on the initial geometry and topology of the, of the molecule, well, this will result in everything getting tangled. But the cell solves this problem every single time. So how is the cell solving this problem? It's using enzymes called type 2 topoisomerases. And so before saying that, let me focus on circular DNA molecules. Here is a circular DNA molecule, for example, a DNA plasmid or a bacterial chromosome. If we think of this green circle as a bacterial chromosome, and this as the origin of replication, here are two replication forks moving bidirectionally toward the termination region. And as they move along ahead of each replication fork, you have an accumulation of positive supercoils. Some of these positive supercoils are removed by type 2 topoisomerases, are relaxed, but others persist there. Some of them are diffused behind the replication fork, forming precatenase. And at the end of replication, there is an accumulation of replication links or replication catenanes. So the quote that I put and these images are just to illustrate to you that the, re the resulting replication catenanes are a direct consequence of the double helical nature of DNA. I mean, there's no mysteries in there. You have a double helix, you open it up. If the helix is circular, you will get... Are you still hearing me? Or did... Yeah. You will get two component links. And these two component links, well, will pose a problem during segregation of chromosomes at cell division. Because now, each one of these components is an identical copy of the original 
parental uh, DNA molecule, and they need to be segregated to separate cells. But they are topologically linked. So the, the cell needs to solve this problem, and it solves it using type 2 topoisomerases. In the case of the bacterium E. coli, the type 2 topoisomerase that is believed to be in charge of this decatenation is topo4. And topo4 will go in and by strand passage reaction will simplify the topology of DNA. There is experimental evidence that other enzymes can also assist with the decatenation process. Topo4 is probably most certainly the most efficient one. So type 2, type two topoisomerases are very fast and very efficient. And fast and efficient, don't, they don't mean the same thing for me. So fast means the reaction is very quick. And efficient means the reaction really follows topological pathways that are optimal for unlinking. So the type 2 topoisomerases know how to do this very well. But there's other enzymes that also seem to be assisting in the process, like type 1 type topoisomerases, the topo, some topo 3s have been found to do this, and the case that I'm going to tell you about. So uh, I collaborate with Dave Sherratt in Oxford, and in the Sherratt lab in 2003, they generated these type of uh, DNA links. These are called torus links, 2 and torus links. They generated 2 and torus links, and they generated torus knots with lambda int, with a site-specific recombination enzyme. And they treated that with XCRCD, DIF, FTSK. So XCRC and D are site-specific recombinases. DIF are the two sites that are recognized as the name of the sites. And FTSK is a powerful translocase that is believed to play an important role in the cell to bring the sites together. And when they incubated these links with XCRCD, they saw that this complex was able to do the unlinking. Slowly but surely, the complex was able to do the unlinking. So that raised the question, is this happening in vivo? Is this happening with replication links? These were just linked plasmids. So they went back to living cells. They extracted. Um, linked plasmids tied up during replication in vivo, and they show that the complex can also unlink them in vitro, and they also have evidence that the comp this complex can unlink the replication links in vivo. So, so that was published in this paper, all the experimental evidence, and we also publish, so there's a little mathematical section in that paper where we publish a how we thought this was happening, so what the pathway, what we thought the pathway was, and the topological mechanism with a very basic topological analysis. So I've continued this work uh, for the last few years. Okay, so this is joint work. I already mentioned Dave Sherratt at the University of Oxford. Um, for that paper, the 2007 NEMBO paper, Ian Grange did a lot of the experiments. He was a postdoc in Dave's lab at that time, and now he's a professor at the University of Newcastle in Australia. And on the mathematical side, I collaborate with Koya Shimokawa from Saitama University. And the work I'm going to present is work of his master's student, um, 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 Masaki Yoshida. And Kai Ishihara, who was Koya's PhD student when we were doing this work. Kai is now a professor at uh, Yamaguchi University in Japan. Okay, so there's two key questions. The first question, and this is the one that I will focus on right here, is the question on reconnection pathways. What are, so the question is the following. What are the shortest topological pathways from a given replication link to the on-link? So I can get a link with two, four, six, eight, any two end crossings, and assuming that the local reconnection reaction unlinks this link, how does it do it? What pathway does it follow? And at each step of the pathway, that's the next question, what is the topological mechanism? So at each step of the reaction, if I go from a six crossing torus link, for example, to some not or link with six or five crossings or whatever number of crossings, what is the mechanism at this level? Okay, so for this we need a mathematical model of, recon of local reconnection. 
This is a completely topological model. Some of you in the audience, you have your mind completely wired up to physics. There's no energies in this model. And you should, I mean, we should talk to put the energies in it, but this is completely to topological model. So DNA is simply modeled as a curve drawn by the axis of the double helix. And if the DNA molecule is circular, then this curve is automatically a circle. And a circle that is properly embedded in three-dimensional space, it doesn't self-intersect. And that's the definition of a mathematical knot. And indeed, DNA can be knotted or interlinked. This is a, a knot published in the Cosarelli lab, 1985. These are two interlinked DNA circle, circles uh, published by the JRM and the, and the uh, Harshi lab in 2002. And there's many examples like that. So a circular DNA molecule will be modeled as a mathematical knot, and a union of circular DNA molecules will be modeled as mathematical links, as disjoint unions of circles that are properly embedded in three-dimensional space. Now, I, here is a table of knots, and I want to pause here a moment from, and take a break from the biology to talk about nomenclature, because I think nomenclature is very important for our community. As we saw, in, in the talks this morning, I mean, they, the speakers be beautifully illustrated the importance of chirality in chemistry, in physics, and also in biology. So, and we also saw the original knot table by Tate. And if we look at that knot table and at any knot table in the back of a knot theory book, so most knot theory books have a knot table in the very back, there's no way to tell whether a knot is, let's put it, in quotation marks, positive or negative. And I would like to have a way to distinguish between what I will call positive knots and negative knots, so that I have an unambiguous way, an unambiguous nomenclature when I'm doing any topological analysis of reconnection, for example. So in, we did a, an extensive study of rice a few years ago, and uh, I should have put that other paper here. So we, pu we published a paper, I think it's 2011. And then we published this small uh, paper 2000, in 2013, where we're proposing to, that our community uses a nomenclature that is guided by the right. And this is based on the conjecture that if we have a knot and we consider the space rise of that knot. So the rise of the knot, if we just look at a knot diagram, so for example here, we assign an orientation to the knot diagram, and then we look at the, at the sign of each one of the crossings, we add the sum of the cross, we add the, the, the crossings, and for this trefoil, for example, we get plus three. Okay, so that's the projected rise. Now, if I take that to three dimensions, the average of the projected rise over all directions can be described as a Gauss double integral, and it's a geometrical invariant, it's not a topological invariant. So for the trefoil, if the trefoil is close to its ideal form, the, average, the, the mean rise or the average rise will be around three as well, 3.2 two or 3.1, depending on the length of the knot and all that. And now, let's consider an ensemble of trefoils, so all possible conformations of the trefoil with all possible lengths, and let's take the average of all those rides. That we will call that the overall ride. And these, these concepts, we didn't introduce these concepts, many people have worked on them, and the conjecture is that the sign of the overall ride of a chiral knot is a topological invariant that you can always distinguish a chiral knot by the sign of the overall rise. Of course, computing this is not so easy. So our study was a numerical study where we approximated this overall rise with computer simulations of polygonal chains both in the lattice and off lattice. And for all knots with up to 10 crossings, we were able to separate that average overall that overall rise from zero with the error bars, keeping it away from zero, and determine what the sign was. If the sign was positive, we put that knot in the table. If the sign was negative, then it's the mirror image. So we have the table. Here it's with up to eight crossings, but if anyone wants to use the table, this is with up to 10 crossings. The table, if we remove the color, is identical to any knot table in any knot book. 
The difference here is, uh, so if, if we look at the Rolfson's table, which is the standard, um, the trefoil in Rolfson's table is negative. So if my node is, is red, that means that I have the opposite chirality than that of Rolfson's. And if the node is yellow, then it's the same chirality as that of Rolfson's, or the node is achiral, in which case it doesn't matter. Okay, so, so there's a table and nomenclature is important. Now, nomenclature for catenanes, for links, is also extremely important. Yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, they all, they, they're all positive, even, even in the minimal projection. I mean, in some cases you have knots where the projection of the figure in the table has right zero. But, uh, but in this case, they, sh they should all have positive right if they're on this table. The same sign. That's forever. I, I guess the limitation would be at the beginning, but the, the first one, well, the first one is this one, but uh, I mean here, the, the first one is, that is this one uh, is a carol, so that's not a problem. Okay, so the, the right is zero. Okay, so for links, this illustrates the problem for links. For links, we have not only to consider the mirror images, but we also have to consider relative orientation of the side, of the of the components. So, so if I call these the links that will be in my link table, then I can consider uh, its mirror image, and then I can reverse the orientation of the original one of of one component of the original one, and I can reverse the orientation of one component in the mirror image. And I could also consider a case where the two green arrows point from right to left instead of from left to right, and that mathematically can be considered as a completely different link. We choose not to do that. We just allow four forms for each two-component link, but, I mean, the, the nomenclature deciding which link goes on the table is difficult. So, and, and why is it important? So, for example, in the context of reconnection, as you will see later, if I have this link with this chirality and this orientation with one reconnection event, I can go to the 5-1, 6-2, or trefoil. If I, instead of taking this one, I take this one right here, I go to completely different topologies. So it is very important that we have an unambiguous nomenclature. As we are now, we go into the not theory tables in books, we go into the not theory tables available online, like not, not info or not plot, and this is quite ambiguous. So that makes the, the details of the work difficult if you're trying to work on, on uh, not and links. Okay, so, so we, we propose a nomenclature for, for the small ones that we're using, and well, this is something we're working on, and the comparison with the others. Okay, and in our, in our work, we'll also see split links, which are just these joint unions, but also the, the, where the linking number is zero, and connected sums like this one or like this one. Okay, so let's go back to the biology. Site-specific recombination, as I explained before, will introduce in one or two steps a double-stranded break, reconnect, and uh, reseal the break with this net effect. And in the case of site-specific recombination, this reaction at the biochemical level is very well understood. So we really understand what are the amino acids here that, that cleave the DNA and everything that's happening inside here is pretty well understood. But that doesn't help me to understand large topological changes. Now, these enzymes can unknot and unlink DNA, as I motivated at the beginning. And the question will be, how are the enzymes inducing these large topological changes? Yes, locally, we understand how they cleave and perform strand exchange, but globally, we don't necessarily understand. And the local action does not imply a global action in general. So this is illustrated here where we have a circle. It could be a DNA plasmid with two recombination sites with a particular orientation. And then this circle is moving in solution. It's a supercoiled DNA. 
The two sides are juxtaposed here with trapping three crossings in the domain, and reconnection produces a two-component link, a hopf link, non-trivial link. Whereas if only one crossing is trapped, reconnection produces a non-link. So what we conclude for this, from this uh, example is that the product topology is a direct consequence of the geometrical conformation adopted by the substrate prior to local reconnection, even if we understand what's happening at the local reconnection level. The global geometry will be crucial to understand the whole process. Okay, so we model the reconnection as a two-step reaction where the substrate, in the case of this talk, the substrate will have complicated topology because we're interested in on linking DNA. So we're interested in topological links or, or knobs. But here in this example, we only have a non-knotted DNA molecule. It goes into a black box where the local the binding happens and the local reconnection event takes place and you obtain either a unique product if the enzymes have topological specificity or a range of topologies a range of product topologies which can be knots or links if we look inside under the microscope under the electron microscope this is what we see i mean this is not my image this is a, a, an old image of Hicks, hicksman in uh, in the 1990s i think or 1980s and here there is site specific recombination enzymes attached to DNA and you see two emanating loops of DNA so these loops here are double stranded DNA are pieces of the double stranded DNA molecule if we started with a single circle as a substrate and we see this if we see two loops coming out there must be two loops inside and this inspired the with Sumner's here in the audience and his then student Klaus Ernst to propose the tangle method to study such specific recombination so they said okay well let's model this enzymatic complex bound to the DNA as a two string tangle which mathematically is a three dimensional ball but it's a topological ball so it can be uh, deformed like illustrated in this figure with two properly embedded segments inside that intersect the ball in, in four distinguished points A, B, C, and D. And we go even further to add a framing to this tangle where, and that framing is, is uh, in the form of a homeomorphism of pairs that takes a three-dimensional ball into the unit ball in three-dimensional space, either R3 or S3, and the four points A, B, C, D, two, four points on the equatorial circle, north, west, northeast, south, east, southwest. And tangles can be studied through their tangle diagrams, just like knots and links, so one can project onto the XY plane and obtain a tangle diagram and uh, most tangle diagrams will be regular so one can distinguish between over and under crossings unambiguously. Okay, so, so this is the definition of two string tangle, a ball, two, so two, two strings, two segments that are intertwined in some non-trivial way maybe or in a trivial way and a homeomorphism of pairs that anchors the tangle. And this homeomorphism of pairs makes life easier, but it also adds complications. And two string tangles can belong to three families. They can be rational, locally knotted, or prime. A locally knotted tangle is one where you can find a local knot in one of the strands, and you can isolate it with a sphere around it that intersects the strand in only two points. A, a tangle is rational if it's homeomorphic to a trivial tangle. This is a trivial tangle right here, for example. So if, if you can deform this tangle without breaking the chain and turn it into something different, what, what you obtain is a rational tangle. And the prime tangles are all the others. And most tangles in biology are rational or sums of rational tangles. So as I mentioned, you start with a trivial tangle with two straight arcs or just one crossing. So the trivial tangles are this one with the two uh, vertical straight arcs or the, that's called the infinity tangle or uh, the zero tangle which is a, a tangle like this with two horizontal arcs or the plus or minus one tangle where you have only one crossing in either orientation, in either chirality. 
And you can take this ball with two straight arcs and with moves similar to the Rubik cubes moves, you can allow to do horizontal twists and vertical twists. But the finite sequence of such moves, you can tie any possible rational tangle. And this is thanks to the classification theorem by Conway in 1970, which puts the rational tangles into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the extended rational numbers. The infinity corresponds to this tangle right here, and any other rational tangle can be uniquely labeled with a rational number. And from the rational number with a continued fraction calculation, we can extract a recipe from, for tying this tangle from the trivial tangle. So for example, here you're taking the trivial tangle and you're doing negative five vertical twists followed by negative two horizontal twists and the negative and the positive is just a sign convention. Okay, so, so now that we know about tangles, let's talk about the tangle method. In the tangle method, there's some assumptions. So the first one is that the enzymatic complex is modeled as a two-string tangle. But this two-string tangle, we're going to compartmentalize it. We're going to divide it or partition it into two compartments, O and P. This division is called the tangle sum. So the, tang the enzyme tangle E is written as the sum of O plus P. And P, I mean, this figure is a bit misleading because O and P seem to have the same size. In reality, P will be a really tiny tangle that only contains the cleavage region. It contains a very, very short piece of DNA that is not flexible at all. So the P tangle will be a trivial tangle. And O, the O tangle contains any other complicated topology outside of P, which will determine the topology of the product after recombination. And the next assumption is that recombination goes by tangle surgery, where it replaces a tangle P with a, another trivial tangle R. And I mean, R could be non-trivial, but if we think in terms of DNA and how short the DNA molecule is in this tangle, the tangle R will also be a very simple tangle. Okay, and then throughout the reaction, O remains constant. Nothing happens inside O. We go down to our assumptions. So for the, the biological application, here is, in the case of XCRC and XCRD, here is a map of the recombination site. It's a very, very short sequence of DNA uh, consisting of 28 base pairs. And Considering that the persistence length of DNA is 150 base pairs, 28 base pairs is very stiff, very hard to bend. So we can safely assume that P is a, is a trivial tangle. And since we're setting up the model, this is the first thing we do when we start the model, we're going to position ourselves so that P looks like two straight arcs in a horizontal position. Now, each of the recombination sites, the recombination sites are described by a sequence, a very specific sequence, and this sequence is typically non-palindromic. In some experiments, it's been made palindromic, but it's typically non-palindromic. So one can assign an orientation to each recombination site. The two sites are identical. So if we think of P as a zero tangle, when we plot it, we can see the recombination sites as pointing in the same direction, here from left to right, or as pointing in opposite directions. Here we say that they are in parallel alignment, that the sites are in, sorry, here, in parallel alignment, and here we say that they're in anti-parallel alignment, and the recombination goes through these two steps, through a holy junction intermediate. In the case of, anti, of O anti-parallel, R will be the infinity tangle. In the case of O parallel, R will be the plus one tangle or the minus one tangle. And this is solely based on the knowledge of the biochemistry that we have at this level. For other applications of reconnection, the assumptions might be different. Okay, so now for each substrate, the, uh, the action is translated into a system of tangle equations, a system of two tangle equations where this, green, this blue tangle is the enzyme tangle that I showed before, and the construction that closes 
the loops at the top and the bottom, so northeast to northwest and southeast to southwest, is called a numerator operation. So this is called numerator of E, but E is O plus P, so this is called numerator of O plus P before recombination, and it's called numerator of O plus R after recombination. And before recombination, we have a substrate topology with a very specific topology K0, and after recombination, we have a product for a single recombination event. We have a single topology product, if we have recombination on an ensemble of substrates, then the products may vary. The topology of the products may vary depending on the enzyme that we're working with. And O, P, and R are two string tangles. We know that P and R are simple, but we don't know exactly what R looks like. And O, we have no idea what it looks like. So we want to solve this system of equations for the tangle O. And for, for R, and we know it's going to be small, but which one of the trivial tangles is it? So the tangle equations, there's a lot of things that are known about tangle equations and tangle theory in the mathematics community. So if O and we know that if we take the sum of two rational tangles, the numerator of the sum of two rational tangles is in the family of four plots or two bridge knots, and two bridge knots have also been classified. So that led uh, Ernst and Sumners to developing tangle calculus, which allows us, if we know that the tangles involved in the reaction are rational or some of rational tangles, the tangle calculus allows us to find solutions to the tangle equations. And by translating the three-dimensional image of the tangle to a very, sim very simple algebraic equations that come by virtue of the classification of rational tangles. There is software to, to solve rational tangles. To, to, so if you're interested to just, uh, you can plug in the knot, the substrate, the product, and see what the different uh, topological mechanisms are. And this is a software that is a stand standalone a Java applet, but there's also a part of Notplot developed by Isabel Darcy with Rob Sharine within Notplot that also solves tangle equations, and uh, they're not identical. So theirs has more things than we do, and ours has contemplates other aspects, so it's worth looking at both of them if you're interested in tangles. Okay, so we get a system of tangle equations. We want to solve it for O and R, and this leads to the collaboration with low-dimensional topologists and, and more uh, and not theorists because these solving tangle equations poses interesting problems. I said we know how to solve the equations if the tangle O is a rational tangle or a sum of rational tangles. But what if it's locally knotted? What if it's prime? Then we don't necessarily, we don't have a tangle calculus and we don't necessarily know how to solve the tangle equations. So in the best case scenario, if I have a system of tangle equations arising from, a, from biology, I would like to prove mathematically using tools from then surgery that O is a rational tangle or a sum of rational tangles. And then I can rely solely on the, on the tangle calculus. This is not always possible. But, but that's, and I'll, I'll go fast through this because I have almost no time. But I can talk to you about this if you want. And I know Dorothy will probably talk a lot about this on Thursday. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip forward to the reconnection pathways, which is really what I want to tell you about today. So again, what are the different ways of going from a replication link to the unlink. We needed all this mathematical formalism for the results that we have about pathways. So the first result we have is that the shortest unlinking pathway of any 2M catenane, so this is not restricted to the six crossing link or eight crossing link. So if you have any 2M crossing torus link of this type right here, I mean, that looks like that, then the shortest unlinking pathway has exactly two M steps. So if you start with a eight crossing link, then the unlinking pathway has to have eight steps. These links are the replication links and they have a very specific orientation of the sites. If the orientation is reversed, then you can go to the unlink in two steps. Okay, so that's the first result. And, and the first result just relies on modeling these with, with uh, two string tangles using the tangle method assumptions. Okay, for the next result, we need to ask something. So now we want to know, okay, so the shortest pathway 
to unlink an eight crossing torus link has eight steps. How many shortest pathways are there? Is there just one? Can I find one? So can I find one? The answer is yes. This is the, the obvious one. And this is the one we published in the biology paper. But are there any others? This is very, very important and interesting. Are there any others to show whether there's there's others or not, we, we need to start by making some assumptions. So we look at the gel electrophoresis coming from the experiments, and we see that the complexity of the products goes slowly down until the, the, the topological links are unlinked. So based on those experiments, we say, okay, well, let's assume that at each step of the reaction, the crossing number goes strictly down. If we assume that the crossing number goes strictly down, so I start with eight crossings and then I go to seven or fewer, then we can show that if I start with an eight crossing link or a six crossing link, so let's say this is an eight crossing link, then the next step will be a seven, one knot. If I start with a six to one link, then the next one will be the five, one knot. And the pattern continues for all the two, the, the two and torus links, and the same thing can be shown with no, for knots. So that means that this six catenane will go to the five one knot. The five one knot will go to the four cat, which is the one we saw this morning. That four cat will go to the trefoil, etc., which is proving that the shortest unlinking pathway under that assumption is unique. So this is the only way, this is the only pathway to take you to this two end torus link to the unlink. Okay, well, that's the unique pathway under a very stringent assumption. So we wanted to remove the assumption, which made us uncomfortable because we're mathematicians, and the biological experiments were not really conclusive about this. I mean, the trend was going down, but was it strictly going down? That's not very clear. So instead of strictly there, right here, we knock that down, and we say, what if it goes down or stays the same? If it goes down or stays the same, at every step, are there other pathways? The answer is yes. And we show that there's nine other pathways. And in this case, for the, starting with the six crossing link, there's all these nine pathways. The one on the diagonal is the one that we had found before. And here, there's a lot of low dimensional topology work that has happened. Some uh, in my collaboration with Koya Shimokawa, some that uh, Dorothy and Kai Ishihara have done. And that work allows us to say that at every step here, each of the red steps have been characterized. So we can find the solutions using tangle calculus. For the black steps, we still don't know the answer. And, okay, well, but now there's nine pathways. And I want a unique pathway, right? I mean, if you're in looking at reconnection in biology, in physics, in chemistry, you want to know, are there many pathways or is there only one? So the next question is, which one is the most probable pathway? That's what I really want to know. So, so then we did uh, numerical work, and I'll zoom through this. So our knots are simple cubic lattice knots, and we perturb them, we generate ensembles of conformations of knots using the BFACF algorithm, which is ergodic within the knot types. And we define a recombination procedure where we find recombination sites along the chain. So here's a, that white bubble is a recombination site. And if there's only one, we perform recombination on it. If there's more than one, we choose one at random and perform recombination of it on it, which is a local reconnection event right here. And by doing that, we slowly can, I mean, we can explore the, the different products and their probabilities, their transition probabilities from a specific topology to other topologies. So here we started with the A21 torus link, and slowly now we're at two crossing link, then there will be an unknot and, and an unlink. So, so that's just to illustrate the process, and I'm almost done. So the result for the limited graph, but the numerical data is not assuming that the complexity remains or goes down. The numerical data is allowing the knots and the links to go anywhere. The complexity can go up. But if we just restrict to this graph, then it's clear that the most favored pathway is the one along the diagonal.
which is exactly what we were hoping for and what we thought would happen. This illustrates all the different pathways that we see with less complexity, I mean, and starting with 9-1 and going down. And this is the whole breadth of the numerical experiment. You're not supposed to understand this. There's no way to understand it, but it's just to illustrate that the moment you start working with knots and links and start allowing reconnection to go up in complexity, you can get to very complicated knots and links. Okay, so this is uh, my group, thank, which I have joined with uh, Javier Arzuaga. And thank you to my collaborators and my funding. Thank you so much. <laughs>